Greetings and welcome back to Route 303 in AP English. And we turn in our study of Dante's Inferno now to Canto 20, Circle 8, Bulgia 4. This one, the fortune tellers and the divines. Now, uh, there are all kinds of paradoxes in Dante in our study of the Divine Comedy, especially here in AP, our study of the Inferno. We're really going to see one of those major paradoxes here. Notice, in already the, the Inferno we have seen that the Sodomites get treated pretty well in Dante's Hell, but he'll jack popes and put them in hell for their greed. And now we're going to get this notion of telling the future is somehow, or ha trying to tell the future, or prophesy for the future, is somehow something wrong with it. I mean, think about this. In uh, Virgil's poem, right, um, we're, we're familiar with the idea that there's always some kind of thing happening in the future. And, speaking of Virgil's Aeneid, I told you in those lectures that there was this really interesting thing that the church began to do in the medieval ages. Um, the Virgilian Lottery, it was called. The Exhortus Virgilianus. And the idea was that you could literally open the, the, the uh, Aeneid at any given point, and if you had a question about something that you, a decision or the future or whatever, you could scroll down randomly, choose a single verse, and that information would give you uh, all you needed to know about the future. Now, to that degree, some people in the Middle Ages began to think of Virgil as a product of white magic. We're going to have that addressed in this poem as well. Of course, think about the fact that Sybil turns up in the Aeneid as the one that tells the future, and Chises, of course, will tell Aeneas his future. And in Canto 9, remember, Virgil will report that he himself was once summoned by the witch Arichtho to go down into the very deepest part of hell and to extract someone. So we got all kinds of interesting paradoxes here. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, the AP folder, I recommend that you find our lectures starting with the Iliad, the Odyssey, and of course the Aeneid, hypercritical to reading this Canto 20, all the way up through and including Dante's Confession, I'm sorry, uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. We've also given guided lectures over Cantos 1 through 19. Let's just remind ourselves of where we've been quickly as we review starting with Canto 1. Lost in a dark wood, the 35-year-old Dante on the 7th of April, 1300 is when this poem is set, and he can't get up this, the mountain of God because of a leopard, a lion, and a wolf. Virgil shows up in Canto 2, after the, um, uh, after the invocation of the muse, we have Virgil saying, Beatrice sent me, and that's why I'm here. Dante says, all right, let's take this journey. In Canto 3, we have the inscription of hell, abandoned hope, all you who enter here, and the uncommitted. In Canto 4, we have limbo and circle 1, that is to say the unbaptized pagans, Homer, Virgil, and Aristotle all end up here. Cantos 5, 6, and 7, the incontinent will follow circle 2, the jack lovers, Dido is there as well as Francesca and Paolo, circle 3 of Canto 6, the gluttons and Chaco, Canto 7, circle 4, the prodigals and the avaricious pushing around big boulders, and circle 5, the sticks with the wrathful and the sullen. In Canto 8, we have Philagius who will take them across the river Styx, Felipe Urgente is there, and they get to the city of Stis, city of, of Satan, the city of hell, they can't get in. In Canto 9, the gates of this are opened by an angel, and they enter officially Circle 6, which is the heretics. In Canto 10, we have Dante's conversation with Farinata and Cavalcante. In Canto 11, we have Virgil giving a map of the rest of hell, and that is predicated on his study of, uh, of Aristotle and, of course, Aquinas. Beginning in Canto 12, we have the violence. In Canto 12, Circle 7, we have the round one, or ring one, the minotaurs, the centaurs the violent against neighbors and the Phalagian uh, river of blood. In Canto 13, circle seven, round two, the violent against self, those are the suicides of the talking trees. In Canto 14, we have circle seven, ring three, and that's the violent against God. These are the blasphemers and Copernicus and uh, uh, the, the old man statue, right? And some prophecies possibly made there. Again, this is a poem that engages in lots and lots of prophecies. We're gonna make a distinction for Dante and the church between prophesying and fortune telling, right? And it all has to do with what motivates and where the origination of the information comes from. In Canto 15 and Canto 16, we are in ring three of Circle 7. This is the violent against nature, as we said it. This is the sodomites, those who engage in uh, homosexual activity. And we commented about why it was considered at the time an unnatural act to do anything, any kind of sex act that did not provide to procreation. 
Brutino, uh, Brutino Latini is, is um, the uh, great advisor and mentor of Dante, mentioned in uh, Canto 15 and in Canto 16. We have the three Florentines who will, in a circle, arm themselves around Dante. And Dante, as we said already, the paradoxes of these poems are amazing. Dante will show tremendous respect to these three. In Canto 17, we will finish the violent with circle seven, ring three, violent against art, these are the users, and then they write Gerion's back to go down into the circle of hell to circle eight in Canto 18, and this is the Malaboge and uh, the simple fraud. Bolgia one, the panders and seducers, uh, Bolgia two, the flatterers, and remember they're eating the excrements, a disgusting word picture. In Canto 19 that we just finished, that's circle eight, Bolgia three, those are the simoniacs, those are the individuals that use the church to gain power and money. Pope Nicholas III, and uh, we get Dante the Reformer talking as well, of course, in accusatory fashion about Boniface VIII, which takes us now to Inferno 20. Now, before we go there again, just to remind, our hope is that you're reading this material on your own and using me. Our learning theory is the quest to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. Through our reading, we do that by answering three guiding questions. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Two A messages, themes two B. We're concentrating at the rhetorical level again with symbolism and irony and again, and again as Dante, as poet, uh, politician, and making his political views, and finally philosopher. And then finally at level three we ask, how can I relate this information to stuff I already know? First in 3A, to the text we've studied in AP and elsewhere, starting with the Iliad and going forward. And then finally, of course, how can I relate to this stuff personally? So a real quick brief summary of Canto 20 before we read it. We're now, as we said, into the fourth ring of the Circle 8 these uh, of, of Malaboge. This is the diviners and those who wish to see the future, right? Interestingly, their punishment, and this is again that example of, uh, of uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas's, the punishment fits the time, uh, the crime, uh, compressor. The idea here is that their heads of these individuals are on backwards, and so their tears run down their back and into the cleft of the buttocks. It's one of the more compelling images, along with from Canto 18 and the and eating human excrement that we will see in all of Inferno. We will get there. We have the longest speech of all of Inferno here by Virgil. This is a very interesting canto. I'll put this in your notes. We don't have any exchange between Dante in any kind of a of a center in this one. Okay, so we don't we we don't have Dante, for example, talking with Tiresias, which would have been fascinating. Instead, we've got Virgil talking about an interesting history of the city of Mantua, where Virgil is from. Now, why he would do that, we'll have to get into. It has a whole lot to do with, I think, Dante trying to make clear that Virgil is himself no um, artisan of astrology or magic. Okay? Um, finally, the, the um, canto will then end with a list of several of the people who were there who engaged in this kind of activity, um, and especially including, although not named, females who are witches. We have said that there's an absence of a lot of women mentioned in the Inferno, here we'll get the mentioning of witches, and of course we're familiar because of our study of the Crucible in our junior year, all of what that means to call somebody a witch. All right, let's turn now uh, to Canto tw um, 20. It really is uh, an interesting canto, unlike in many ways, and you'll see this when we start reading it, unlike any of the cantos which came before. It is clear as we begin this canto, the new pains of hell that I saw next demand new lines for this Canto 20 of the first canzon, which is of those submerged in the underground. Now, narrators have, or uh, scholars have pointed out of this poem that probably what happened is up to this point, Dante had been sending parts of his poem to Ken Grundy uh, della Scala, the, the scholar who was helping him edit, and now all of a sudden it's like we have a clear break with these lines, new lines for this Canto 22 of the first canto, the, the Inferno, right? Readying myself at the cliff's bank, I looked down into the canyon my master had revealed and saw that it was watered by tears of pain. All through the circular valley I beheld a host of people coming, weeping but mute. Uh, the, not, the amount of weeping and the amount of silence now all of a sudden. Notice, it's an interesting juxtaposition, Dante the poet now for a moment. Sometimes we have tremendous noise Either it can be screaming, or it can be thunder, or it can be waterfalls, or it can be all combinations. And then other times it's dead silent. 
Sometimes we can have really defiant sinners, and then other times just weeping silent sinners. Think of Paolo with Francesca, weeping sullen and silent, right? They walked, these people that he saw, at a solemn pace that would be called liturgical here above, so kind of slowly walking in a circle. But as my sight moved down their bodies, I sense a strange distortion, this distortion we're going to come back to in a moment, that made the angle of chin and chest not right. The head was twisted backwards, some cruel torsion forced face towards kidneys, and the people strode backwards because deprived of forward vision. So notice the idea again is uh, of compassion, uh, of the, the punishment fits the crime. Notice in life they spent their time trying to see the future, and in their afterlife their heads are turned around so that they cannot see anything but backwards, punishment for trying to see the future. Perhaps, this is an interesting aside for, for Dante the poet, Perhaps sometime a palsy has wrung the head of a man straight back like these or a terrible stroke, but I've never seen one do so and doubt it could. And then Dante the Poet speaks directly to you, the reader. Reader, he says, God grant you benefit of this book. Again, this poem is a propedeutic instructional. Try to imagine yourself how I could have kept tears of my own from falling for the sake of our human image so grotesquely reshaped. Of course, Dante the poet is making the observation that Dante the philosopher will make. It's a very dangerous thing to try and see too much into the future. Your punishment can be harsh and here worthy of tears, right? Truly, he says it this way, tears of my own from falling for the sake of our human image so grotesquely reshaped, contorted so the eyes' tears fell to wept the buttocks at the cleft. So, in other words, they are crying, but their heads are around backwards, and the tears run down their cheeks and down their backs, not down their chest, and then into the cleft of the buttocks. Few images as compelling as this one, and at the same time, disturbing as this one. Truly, he says, I wept, leaning on an outcrop of that rocky site, and my master spoke to me. Do you suppose you are above with the other fools even yet? Here, pity lives when it is dead to these, have no pity for these whatsoever. Who could be more impious than one who dared to sorrow at the judgment God decrees? In other words, Virgil giving Dante the sermon, how dare you question the justice of God? These individuals wanted to try to use magic to see the future, and for that, they are punished in the afterlife. They deserve no pity. He continues, raise your head, raise it and see one walking near, for whom the earth split open before the eyes of all the Thebans. Uh, this is from our study of Seven Against Thebes. Uh, go back to our, uh, our conversations with Hamilton's mythology. Um, and uh, uh, this is Amphiarius who tried to escape and was checked by an earthquake. And their suggestion here is that maybe his major sin was he tried to see too much of the future. Why are you leaving the war, Amphibious? The others shouted. What place are you rushing to? So he plunge down the crevice to Minos, who seizes all. See, Amphirius making his shoulders his breast, because his purpose was seeing too far ahead, he looks behind and stumbles backwards. There's the line. And this is, of course, the curse on all astrologers, all would be prophets, all would be fortune tellers. He looks behind and stumbles backwards. And here is Tiresias. Now this is interesting. Tiresias the great hero of many of Greek poems. I mean, we immediately, don't we, we think about, for example, Sophocles' Antigone or Sophocles' Oedipus Rex when Tiresias shows up. What makes Tiresias interesting? Go back to our Edith Hamilton's lectures. Hamilton herself will point out this story from Metamorphoses, book three, lines 322 to 331. Tiresias was a man walking down the road, saw two snakes copulating, broke them up with his staff. Herod gets mad. She curses him and makes him into a woman. He lives the life of a woman for a while, a number of years, and then sees uh, two uh, um, um, snakes copulating again, doesn't break them up, allows for them to continue, and therefore is returned to, back to a man. The key here about Tiresias, two things, one for your notes. One, Tiresias has lived both the life of a man and a woman and remembers what they are. Two, Tiresias was always involved in trying to foretell the future. Now what's fascinating is that Tiresias is almost always right in Greek mythology and yet here he is. 
Here is Tiresias, line 40, the seer who changed from male to female, unmanned through all his body until the day he struck a second time with his staff at serpents intertwined and resumed his manly plumage. He, with his back shoved nose to the other's front, is called Arnus. This is an Etruscan, um, and some argue that he predicted Julius Caesar's victory. Um, we get the story through Lucian. Living on the slopes, the Caranes work from villages below. He had clear vistas. We're back to this thing about sight again. It's always about sight. See, Amphirius earlier, right? From his cave among white marble, he could scan the stars or gaze at waves below in the distance. And she, whose loose hair covers her breasts unseen on the side away from you, where other hair grows, was Manto, who searched through many lands and then settled in the place where I was born, Mantua. Of this, hear me a while. Now at this point, and, this, and the, again, this is kind of a strange canto for this reason. For some reason, Dante the poet decides he wants Virgil now to tell a long story about why, in the end, Mantua is not a city of, of uh, Satan or magic or any of those kinds of things, which seems to be trying, Dante trying to dispel this notion that somehow Virgil should be associated with white magic and astrology and, and telling of the future. Of this, hear me a while. Her father dead in Bacchus' city and slave, she for a long time chose to roam the world. Again, we're talking about Manto. Where a wall of mountains rise to form fair Italy's borders, above Trilio lies Lake Benaco, fed by a thousand sources, Grada and Valcomincha and Pino, all watered by streams that settle in that lake. These are all uh, close to Lake Garda. Uh, the three special dioceses all meet in this one location. The island amid it, the pastors of Tarantino, Brescia, Verona, might bless if they should take a way that leads there. At the shore's low place, Perisius' splendid fortress towers make their challenge to the Brescans and the Bergamese. There, all the cascades Benaco cannot contain within its bosom join in one river that flows through rich green pasture. As soon as it starts to rain, the water, Benaco no more, is Medico instead, and joining the poet Grevelino, it soon spreads to a marsh in summer, sometimes, sometimes fed it. There, Manto the savage virgin, virgin set in mid-fed, a stretch of dry land until uninhabited, and there she stayed and lived, where she could shun all humans to ply her arts, arts of divination, in a place she shared only with servants. And when her life was gone and her soul ascended, there its shell was interred. Afterwards, families scattered about that country, gathered where march on all sides made a ward against attackers. And when they built their city over her bones, with no lots or divination, they named it Mantua. In other words, Dante has Virgil say, I come from Mantua, but Mantua is actually not a special city of diviners or astrologers because of, because of Manto, right? Before full Casalido was deceived by Pemanonti, its population was larger. So he says, let no other history I charge you belie my city's true inception. In other words, the idea here is that um, we're, we're going to say, my city is just a normal city. Now what's fascinating is that he ascribes the founding of Mantua to Manto, Dante does. But in the Aeneid, book 10, line 198 to 200, some of you will maybe remember this, Virgil actually says that Mantua was founded by Osinus, son of Mantua, and the river god of the Tiber. So you've got a kind of interesting, um, an interesting dichotomy here, maybe a screw up of a kind, right? Um, so, now, now, Dante, now Dante the Pilgrim, I, Master, your speech in, inspires such certainty and confidence that any contradiction of what you say would be dead coals to me. Um, the, the, in other words, oh, oh, okay, well, now, Dante says, I completely understand this whole thing about the Sortis Virgilianes, the, the uh, Virgilian lottery, and all of that, None of that should carry any weight whatsoever, is his point here. But speak again now, Dante the Pilgrim will finish out the ganto. But speak again of these souls in sad procession. Are any passing below us worthy of note? For my mind keeps turning back in that direction. Notice the irony of turning back, right? Then he, now Virgil, 
That one whose beard has spread in a mat that covers his brown shoulders was Augur when Greece was short of males, the Trojan War. He divined the time to cut the first ship's cable at Oleus along with Calchas, his name as my tragedy sings. Mentioned, obviously, in the Aeneid. You who know it entirely know the passage is Eupirilios. Now, um, again, this is the Augur that told him it was time to sail for Troy and all of that. By the way, did you notice this? As my tragedy sings, you who know it entirely know the passage. We're back to this idea that maybe Virgil is not as red. Remember earlier we said that Virgil was hoarse when he meets Dante for the first time. The suggestion maybe is that there should be more reading of Virgil closer, if you will. All right. That other with skinny flanks is Michael Scott for the office fans in the house. Guess what? Here's Michael Scott in hell. He was a uh, diviner um, um, from 1175 to 1235. He was a Scottish astrologer, actually, to Frederick II of Palermo. That other with skinny flanks is Michael Scott, who truly knew the game of magic fraud. See, and then another one now, Guido Bonanati and Ascendi, too late. He wishes he'd struck to leather and cobbler's thread, repenting here his celebrated predictions. Um, Ascendi, uh, toothless it means, uh, was a famous shoemaker of Parma, uh, Mastro uh, Benevito, and here he, he is put in hell. He should have stuck with making shoes instead of trying to predict the future. And this wretched crowd of women, now we'll just get witches, all chose to trade loom, spindle, and thimble. We saw a lot of that, didn't we? That weaving in the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. Here, notice, instead of sticking with the domesticated arts that, sh that should be what women do, Dante says, they went and became witches, and now here they are. Thimble for telling of fortunes, potions, wax images, incantation, and charm. Of course, where is Sybil? And of course, Sybil was necessary for Virgil's own Aeneas to have his trip into the underworld. There's, there's all kinds of paradoxes and ironies here at the end of this one. But come, already Cain in the moon, um, this is Italian folklore, the idea was that after Cain kills